We've been uh, in our series called, uh, sermon series called The Power Series. We started off last week kicking this series off on the power of our speech. The power of our speech. And if you remember, what was the two things that our, our, our words does or has the potential to do? And it hurt and heal. That's right. Power of our speech that we're to be careful what we speak because literally as... God is uh, in us and he's called us and made us his own. We have the ability to speak words of life, of health, of healing over people, but we also can speak destruction, words that hurt, that damage, that take at times years to unravel, to heal. This week, uh, we're going to continue this series and it's on the power of silence. The power of silence. Talked on the power of speech last week. How... um, I think we're all used to t- talking. Uh, well, we're going to talk about the power of silence, learning the discipline of solitude. How many of you uh, enjoy uh, being in a quiet place? Right. Oh, okay. All right. We got a few uh, introverts like to be in a quiet place. That's good. Silence. How can we live in silence in a world that's addicted to noise? We have to have something or someone inputting in our lives. We can't even be in a quiet room. TV has to be on, radio, iPod, iPad, the phone, on the phone, Netflix, You name it, something has to be playing. If not that, you're either reading the newspaper, reading the book, constantly taking in. Some of us may even feel like, whatever you do, just don't leave me alone with my own thoughts. For some people, being left alone to their thoughts can feel very lonely and isolated. For some people, it leads even into depression Some people call it the battlefield of the mind, being alone and hearing these thoughts in our heads. How many of you are guilty of always having something on? Music, TV, right? So um, we could call this uh, part some distraction. So why don't you help me? What's your your choice of distraction? This is a a dialogue here, right? So we're going to talk. So let me hear from you. What's your choice of distraction? Distraction. What do you like? Facebook. Facebook. Woo. How many of you? How many of you on Facebook? Oh, the rest of you are lying. I saw you last night on there. <laughs> Let's try. How many of you on Facebook? How many of you spend maybe like more than uh, two hours of your day on Facebook? Uh, okay. Thank you for your honesty. That's good. All right, Facebook. That's one one way that we get noise, distraction. What else? Something else that you listen to, watch. YouTube. Oh, yes. Right? How many of you love YouTube? Watching like, yeah. You, you start with like one video you look up, and next thing you know, you're two hours in it, and you're watching a cat do flips or something. It's like, how in the world did I get here? It's two hours gone, just like that. All right, something else. What's your choice to watch or listen? Fox News. That's good. Something else. Music. Music, right? You got your iTunes. You got Spotify. Something always playing. All right, something else. Let me hear from you. TD Jakes. Hey, now there you go. That's not necessarily a distraction. Well, can be maybe if you're not doing your house chores and stuff or not working. How many of you uh, are Netflix people? Netflix? All right. All right, let me hear from you. I know there's more. There's more distractions you constantly turn on. Instagram. Now we get into it. I heard somebody say sports. Who says sports? How many of you watch sports, right? ESPN junkies, right? Our world is constantly filled with things 
giving or wanting to make itself known or heard. Really, that's what it's about. Either people, companies, businesses. It's all about making themselves heard, and we do a good job at listening and watching. In our world that we're living in, where we're constantly taking in, though, I believe there's something that we need to learn about pulling back, learning to withdraw. Jesus did that. We're going to kind of walk through some scriptures here of even Jesus in his own life, how he withdrew to listen, to hear. It's the power of silence and learning the discipline of solitude. Power of silence can be used for good and for the bad. In the Bible, silence was a sign of reverence to God. When we begin to understand God's attributes, in other words, you begin to contemplate and think about how powerful God is, how his, it's his omnipotence. He's all powerful. He's able to create people out of the dust of the ground and he's able to heal and do miracles and do mighty things today. It still amazes me how powerful he is. His omniscience, his, how he can think. He's an all-knowing God. He knows everything about you, your neighbor next to you, the person behind you, your son, your daughter, your grandma, your grandpa. Everything about you that you went through will ever go through. He knows everything about you. God is so big and powerful and knows everything about you. And you think about even his omnipresence, that God can be everywhere at once. Think about how big God is. Remember when we went on a, a, to Swaziland in Africa on a missions trip, and there we are with people singing in Swahili. And there God is, his presence so evident. Don't understand a word that they're singing or saying, but God's presence is there. He's everywhere at once. He knows how to speak your language, what you go through, knows how to talk your talk. God is all-powerful. And out of this, there usually is a sign of reverence or silence. I don't know about you, but if you've ever really been where the presence of God is just hovering and blanketing, at times no one even says a word. You don't have to say a word. When God is present, what do you say? He already knows you, wants to minister to you, speak a word to you, wants to heal you and touch you. So this type of silence is good. In Joshua chapter 6, silence was a sign of expecting God to fight their battles and silence their enemies. Some of you got maybe some enemies, some people talking a whole lot about you, right? Well, Joshua, he prayed. And he was silent even when his enemies was talking about him because he was expecting God to fight his battles for him. How many of you need somebody to fight your battles for you? How many of you tend to fight your battles and tend to mess things up like myself? Right? You get all your words twisted up. You got to apologize later. Say sorry for something that you didn't mean to say in the moment. God wants to fight your battles for you. These are good ways of being silent before the Lord. Job 29, silence was a time of anticipating wisdom from another person. This time I've been around uh, great leaders, pastors. Uh, we just came back this week. We are at our um, district council all week long, and we're with other great pastors from the Assemblies of God. And as you just sit there and you be under their ministry and get alongside them, I just at times just sit in silence and wait for their wisdom. Sometimes we can just be quick to talk and shoot off our mouth and miss maybe what's coming our way to hear. It's good to be silent. There are other times in the Bible that maybe silence was used in a bad way or a bad connotation. Ezekiel 16 talks about how when we are in shame at times, people can face silence. Right? How many of you ever been embarrassed by something? A shame, and it's like, oh, oh, I wish I could crawl under this chair or this table and hide somewhere. Right after the meeting's done, poof, head right out the door. Please, nobody see me. Don't ask me nothing. Don't even bring this conversation up again. Shame. Shame will bring silence over your life at times. At times in the Bible, silence was attached to suffering. We see this in Lamentations chapter 3. That when people suffered great suffering, that uh, Lamentations, 
that is really written about uh, probably Jeremiah who's writing Lamentation is really reflecting over the fall and, and all what they had watched and all the dreams and their hopes of the people of Israel who thought that God would establish their, the kingdom there and now they're all in ruins and now they're sitting in suffering really because of their own doing. But they were being silent. There's a time silence and anger. See that in Psalms 4.4. How many of you, when you get mad, you're like, not a word comes out, right? Silent. How many of you give the silent treatment, right? I know there's more ladies than three of you that give the silent treatment. How many of you give the silent treatment? Guys too. Yeah, guys too, right? Oh, I fix you up. Oh, oh, you was talking to me. Oh, I never hear you. What, what did you say? Oh, I never hear you. The silent treatment. We can be angry and hold our tongue. Silence can be used for good things and for bad things. Whether you've experienced a good or bad type of silence way down deep inside of us all, I believe we can benefit from solitude. Solitude is a time where Jesus wants us to come away, hear, listen. It's a time of rest, quietness, and inner quiet peace, alone time with God, dependency on knowing that God is in control. How many of you could use some rest, right, some peace in your life? So what is solitude? It's really my first point, the discipline of solitude. The discipline of solitude. So what is solitude? Solitude is the state of being alone. State of being alone. It's often considered one of the traditional spiritual disciplines, Really, it's um, many of them would be like prayer, fasting, solitude, study. These are all throughout church history, spiritual disciplines that really God calls us to because these are inward disciplines. Because what's inside of us will eventually make its way outside of you. That God wants to get a hold of our hearts, our minds, so that what's in us will eventually flow out of us. So solitude is one of these traditional spiritual disciplines. Many times solitude is associated with silence. The idea is to be alone with God, to pray, to meditate on his word, and to simply enjoy his presence. I'll never forget the first time that um, I heard about this when we went to Bible college, and there are many of us that went from this church, and while we were there, we were in our um, spiritual formation class and as they taught on solitude we had to take a, a during the week take an entire day 24 hours and not talk not turn on the tv not turn on the radio not turn on music don't do anything like that clear your entire schedule 24 hours it was tough it was rough you don't realize how often we run to filling emptiness to hide or cover up for fear of awkwardness. Even when people came up to talk to you, you couldn't talk, so we all had to make signs and we'd pull it out, pull it out and we'd pull it and say, I'm doing my day of solitude. I can't talk right now. We did this on campus. You know what, though? It was a transforming, a life transformational experience because what we began to do is start really hearing and listening. You start hearing even your own self talk to yourself. All these negative things at times because it's not just positive things. And you start dealing with the real you. And sometimes we can be quick to drown it out instead of dealing with it. Instead of facing it with the help of the Lord. I tell you what, those 24 hours was life-changing. Every so often, they would always tell us to go back, and maybe you can't do 24 hours in a day, but maybe you can do an hour. Maybe you can do 10 minutes, set aside to just listen. All we could do was take a journal and a pen, and you were just there to listen. You weren't even there to pray. You try that, not praying. Some of us, we're quick to pray. We always like talk to God, but God is already sometimes talking to us, but we're just not listening. Our job was just to listen to God. I believe the Holy Spirit is always talking. If we're ready and willing to hear, 
I know the Holy Spirit, that he speaks through our children's church. We have our children's church next door and our, our little kids next door. I know God even talks to them in their little age. If you and I will be open, he wants to talk to us. Psalms 46 verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. At times in our lives, I don't know about you, but it's so quick to, we can be quick to run to someone else. Hey, I got to tell you about my troubles, my problems. Can you pray for me? And I'm all about prayer. Hey, you, this happened to me. Did you hear what happened? Did you hear what happened at work? Pick up the call, text message, Facebook somebody. And we're so quick to run to other people at times when really the first place the Lord wants us to run to is to him. That should be our natural instinct is to say, God, I got to talk to you about something. Something happened today and before I run and tell everybody else about my problems, Lord, maybe you have something to say about this situation. Maybe you're wanting to talk something to me today. Be careful not to run to every other person. It's okay. Sometimes you may be in a season where you don't know the voice and you're confused and the enemy is taking advantage. By all means, get a hold of someone godly you can talk to. But don't use it as a crutch. Eventually, the Lord wants to discipline you, train you up as a disciple to begin to hear his voice. He wants to talk to you. Be still and know that he is God. Some people use solitude as a way to distance themselves from distractions of the world. We just talked about some distractions. YouTube, Facebook, TV, telephone, texting, you name it. Ultimately, there are distractions. You see that we're in Oahu and um, we're in Ala Moana food court. You see a family around the table and everyone's on their phone. No one's even talking to each other. I was thinking, hmm, that's weird. That's odd. And yet I know myself at times I do that myself. Check in constantly, emails, text messages. You got to respond to people. <clears throat> Be careful that the distractions don't overtake what really matters. Being alone can also be used as a time to rest and refresh. The Bible certainly supports the value of solitude. Lamentations 3, 25 to 28 says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear up his yoke when he is young. Let him... Sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it upon him. I pray that you and I would get a little more comfortable at times in silence, being alone. If you're married, get comfortable. Sometimes Leisha and I, we're sitting next to each other not saying anything at all, but we know we're there. It doesn't have to be said. And yet, I know my hesitation, my distraction, I want to reach for the remote. We'll just turn on. I watch the food channel. It's probably my weakness. It's wrong. Tempt myself to go eat something. Sit alone in silence. A discipline is something that can be learned. Maybe you don't have this in your life. That's why I call it a discipline. Discipline of solitude. It can be learned. Even so, if you've never played baseball before, it's something that you can learn over time. You can learn how to swing a bat. You can learn how to throw a ball. You can learn how to take those bases and watch for cues. You can learn how to slow down, stop, and listen for the voice of God. It's a discipline, and it can be learned. We haven't been taught silence and focus. In truth, monks at times would leave the world and head to the wilderness for times of alone and and this quietness and really they were out in search for two things they wanted to find find god in the depths of their souls see monks they would go out retreat and the second thing they did it to prove that god was sufficient for their souls you see they've had part of it right as monks but you see what they were missing was really jesus and the part of yes they could get away and know god but you can't truly know god without knowing jesus so in part, they had the discipline, right, of listening and getting to know God and his character. They had half of it right. The other half was 
God, Jesus calls us to be amongst people. That's the difficult, I mean, part. I mean, the easy part is when you're on vacation, you don't gotta, you don't gotta see nobody, you don't gotta talk to nobody, you don't need to go to work and hear that person who is always ragging you down, talking about you. That's the hard part. See, Jesus called us out not to remain in the wilderness, but to live in the middle of darkness and be that light. That's what he's called us. Yes, we're to withdraw. Jesus withdrew, but he also came back in the middle of the crowd. 5,000 people began to feed them. This says that when Jesus walked into one city and he walked out the other way, there was not one person who wasn't healed, who wasn't cast out the devils, who wasn't delivered. Jesus knew how to be with people. But it first started with a time of solitude, time of getting away. Remember when the crowds pressed him, he would say, he'd call his disciples, come on, let's get away. It starts with solitude. Who are we in the depths of our souls? We need to learn to live our lives from our center, from the inside out of what the Holy Spirit puts inside of you and I. Let it flow out of our hearts. The world uses silence, in truth, as forms of punishment, right? Um, you see that even with um, solitary confinement when they lock up someone. You think about it. I mean, in truth, they're in the safest place they could be. No one else to harm them or hurt them. They're usually under watch. They're in the safest place, but it's a form of punishment. Why? Because at times it's the mind and the things going on in there. We use that, right, even... Kids who do timeout. How many of you do timeout, right, with your kids? I'm not going to ask you how many of you just gently, you know, encourage your children. I don't want to know. God wants you to train up your children. And we shouldn't have spoiled children. By the times we use this as a form of punishment, timeout, think about what you've done. Even in relationships, we tend to punish people with silence, right? We said that some of you ladies and men, we give the silent treatment when we can't speak up. God wants to redeem our times of silence. Not make it an awkward, uncomfortable place, but allow the Holy Spirit to speak words of life. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak words of comfort, of peace. He wants to give you joy. And at times of drawing away, I want to encourage you to withdraw at times, even if it's for maybe it's five minutes. Maybe your place of solitude is in your bathroom where no one else goes in there but you. And you got five, ten minutes of alone time. Hey, let's just be real, right? We live in the real world. Sometimes I, I know some of you wish that, boy, I wish my house was quiet. There ain't no place in my house that's quiet. Maybe it's getting alone in the bathroom. Get in some time of solitude and take that time to talk to the Lord. God wants to speak to you if you will open your ears to listen. Also, the disciples practice solitude. The disciples. Moses who met regularly with the Lord in the tabernacle. Exodus 33, 7 says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside of the camp far off and he called it the tent of meeting where everyone sought the Lord and would go out to the tent, which was outside of the camp. How many of you have a place, that uh, place of refuge, safety, place where you can find solitude or rest? How many of you have a place that you go to? If you don't, there's a couple of you. I'll tell you, uh, for mine, it's honestly anywhere near the water. Uh, if you, you can usually find me down Bayfront. I'm parked down there. Maybe stressed, pressured, get alone. I pull up there and I sit there and I just talk to God and I listen. It's my place of solitude, anywhere near the water. I just start looking and listening. If you don't have a place to retreat, get away to find some place, I encourage you. Find some place. Maybe it's some place you drive to. Maybe it's in your home somewhere. I remember well, while we were living in Massachusetts, I had to make a place of solitude. So what did I do? I built, we were living in a basement. And even as short as I was, I would hit my head as I go in the laundry room. And I'd get in that basement and I built this little cubby hole that away from everything that I could go in there and just be alone with God. 
even if it meant for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and I would sit in there. At times I would read, at times I would pray, and at times I would just sit there and say, God, talk to me. Holy Spirit, talk to me. I need to hear your voice today. What are you saying? What do you have for me today? Lord, I'm going through this difficult situation, and I don't have any answers. Talk to me, Holy Spirit. And I would get away and retreat into this little cubby hole. He asked Laisha. It's a little wooden thing I built. In fact, when the landlord came, he came and looked, and he's like, what is this thing? I said, oh, don't worry. It's just like storage, you know, place under here. He's like, oh, yeah, because I see you attached it to the wall. I said, don't worry. I'll fix it all up. Don't worry about that. It was my place of solitude. Moses had a place of solitude. I encourage you, if you don't have some place that you retreat to, to hear the voice of God, find some place. Maybe it's for you, it's in your car, right? The only place, you're driving to work, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Shut the radio off. Get alone with God. You start talking to him or just begin to listen to him and his voice. Amen. God also spoke to Elijah, not just to Moses. I love this passage. Here Elijah is, right? He uh, slaughters the prophets of Baal. He's there, and after a conquest on that mountain there, then the woman comes to him, and he retreats and flees, even after killing 450 prophets. These are evil prophets. He retreats and flees. Goes into the cave, into hiding. What is this saying here? First Kings 19. Starting from about verse 10. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Imagine how strong that wind must have been to rip rocks off of the hillside but the lord wasn't in the wind and after the wind there was an earthquake but the lord wasn't in the earthquake and after the earthquake came fire but the lord wasn't in the fire imagine him in this cave he's seeing winds and it's shaking fearing maybe rocks falling down there's fire going on the outside but the lord wasn't in that and after the fire the sound of a low whisper a low whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face, face in cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? That may be a word for someone here today. You may be hiding in your cave just like Elijah, after you would think, after his courage to slay 450 prophets on the mountain, then he gets chased off by a woman. He's hiding in fear of his life and thinking he's going to die in there. And then a small whisper speaks a word that says, what are you doing in there, Elijah? Maybe for some of you, maybe the God needs to speak that word to your heart. It says, what are you doing in your cave? What do you have to fear? What are you afraid of? Don't you know I'm with you? Don't you know if I'm with you, who can be against you? Don't you know you have more for you than against you? What are you doing in there? God's reminding Elijah, he says, I'm with you. I've always been there. But it was in a still, small voice. I want you to listen for the voice of the Lord, even this week. Even in, uh, we're going to have our connect groups throughout this week, and we're going to begin diving into these, these words and these passages of learning to practice the presence of God and learning to listen to God's voice this week. I want you to listen to his still small voice because he wants to talk to you. Amen. He talked to Jacob. He talked with Jesus. Jesus, who often withdrew to lonely places and prayed in Luke 15. Jesus himself, the son of God, fully God, fully human, even he had to withdraw for a time of solitude and rest and getting alone to be with the Father. How much more do we? We can't keep up in this high pace of life of going, going, going. We got to, I mean, we don't even have time to sit. We got to go through a drive through even for a cup of coffee. Praise God for that. 
Starbucks or Just Cruise and Coffee. I like that place. Maybe we don't even have time to sit anymore. It's all about quick, fast pace, microwave. Now, our freezer is full of food that you can just throw in the microwave. There's even rice. We bought this from Costco's. Pull out a bowl, peel it off, put it in the microwave. One minute, I'm eating brown rice. What? How many of you, had, how many of you guys knew that? What? That thing is awesome. I mean, for quick meals, you can't beat it. <laughs> One minute, pull it off. Brown, you know how long brown rice is. You got to soak them half hour and then cook another 45 minutes. One minute. But if we're not careful, we get caught up with our culture that's quickly driving everything, the faster we can get it, in and out. Come get your uh, car lubed up in half an hour. Drop it off and wait here. We get you all lubed up. If we're not careful, we get into this same custom, this lifestyle, this pattern. I need McDonald's, Burger King. We got to have it my way. We get so quick and accustomed to this that we don't slow down at times. Because really, it's God who defines our culture. See, it's a kingdom culture that redefines it. We preach on that, redefining what greatness looks like. And God calls us to redefine even what we call important in our culture. Jesus calls us to slow down, pull away. Some of you, maybe you need to start pulling away, even maybe you and your wife. Take your time to pull away. Lisha and I, we, we had our little one, we even brought up um, my sister-in-law to come help with the baby while we're at this conference and man I need a vacation after this vacation just you and I just to get away we had one day the next day my mother-in-law thank you bless you mom for watching our little guy we had one day just being alone away just even my wife and I to just talk without no one screaming no poop flying anywhere no food flying anywhere to think Boy, it was very nice. It was short-lived, but it was very nice. Time to reconnect. Maybe for some of you, if you're married, you need to pull away for a time of solitude, maybe even in your marriage. Just you to reconnect to what really matters. May not be long. May not be overnight. Maybe just for the day. Pull away and reconnect. Jesus was seeking out solitude after performing Miracles, we're constantly working, doing, but he sought solitude. In times of grief, Jesus pulled away. Before choosing the 12 apostles, Jesus pulled away. In his distress at Gethsemane, he pulled away in solitude. Solitude was a consistent practice of Jesus' life. If Jesus had to do it in truth, even more so you and I need to. And I really bring this message. It may not be that popular for what we face and what we go say. Pastor, do you know my life, what I go through? I'm not just raising my kids. I'm raising my grandkids and then my grandkids' grandkids. I know some of you, you got all these generations, difficulties, some facing foreclosure, working two, three jobs. How in the world am I going to pull away and have solitude? Don't let this culture define what matters to you. You begin redefining what's important. God begins setting that standard. God wants to speak to us, and at times it happens in silence. Learn to pull away. God has spoken to his people all throughout church history in times of solitude. And finally, there are many different benefits to pulling away in times of solitude. There's times of soul refreshing how many of you could use your soul to be refreshed a good washing how many of you, when you jump in the water like i love swimming when i jump in the water it's like oh i come out and it's like whew, i can go another day just refreshed there's something that happens also just like when you jump in that water sometimes i used to go when we used to live up uh come out of city drive up chong street i pull on the side of the road after work jump in there refresh jump back in head home refreshed. I don't know if you've ever had your soul, your heart, your mind just refreshed by the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you there's nothing like it being in the presence of God when he speaks a word of peace over your life in the middle of your circumstance and your difficult situations that you're in. It's a refreshing that you and I can get from nothing else. We seek it in everything else, but I'm telling you it only can be found in him. Psalms 23, 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. He wants to be your 
shepherd. Shepherd, if you're interested, you begin studying the shepherd, and he calls us his sheep, right? But when you begin really studying what God calls himself the sheep and uh, uh, the shepherd and us the sheep, really sheep are kind of dumb. They really are. How many of you ever raised sheep before, right? At times they are. They're stupid. Get themselves in all kinds of trouble. Do things crazy. You're always untangling them from something, one following the other, leading themselves astray. And he relates that to them, but he gives himself the good shepherd as the example that at times when he says, even in Matthew, that Jesus is that gate and a doorway. And as the shepherd, he watches the sheep. There was only one doorway into the pen, and Jesus would stand there. He gives himself as the shepherd. As the sheep went in, he would touch the sheep, make sure they're doing okay, examine them. He knew them by name. He wasn't afraid to be touched and smell stink and dirty like a sheep. He knew them. God even so watches you come in and go out. And there's not a person here sitting here that he doesn't know your name. That he doesn't touch you as you go in and as you come out. And that he doesn't know what you're going through, what you're feeling. He doesn't, he sees that broken leg and how you're limping. And when you think no one else is seeing it, he's seeing you. And at times he has to take you and maybe he's going to put you on his shoulder if you'll let him. Other times when there are difficult sheep, who sheep who don't listen, at times the shepherd would have to take that rod and literally break that leg of the sheep. He'd break that leg of the sheep so that it would listen, but what he would do is he put that sheep on his shoulders. Then he would carry that sheep. See, God at times will correct you and I. I don't know about you, if you've ever faced the correction of God before. If, I, if you've never, I can I just give you a suggestion? It's better to just listen and obey and do your own thing and face the correction of God. God, at times when you hard-headed, you think, I ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. I know it all. No, tell me. At times God will take it. He break our leg and he puts us on his shoulder so that every place the shepherd goes, the sheep goes. And if the sheep knows that he can trust that shepherd, that he's not just going to do what hurts him, but he's going to watch over him and, and care for that leg until it gets better. So that when he puts that sheep back on the ground again, he begins to follow and obey. Why? Because God loves you and I. He disciplines us because he loves us. Whom the Lord loves, he corrects. If you haven't been corrected by the Lord, well, I... I I doubt it if you're truly loved because if you're a parent, uh, we're constantly correcting. We got our little guy. It seems like we're teaching every day, 24-7. No, don't touch that. No, don't do that. Say, like, okay, yes, you can do this. Constantly teaching. Jesus wants to be your good shepherd. Not just your good shepherd. He says he's your chief shepherd. He wants to look after you and care for you. He wants to talk to you. He says, my sheep know my voice and not another they'll follow. At times when, if you study that passage in Matthew, Jesus would walk to the gate. And as he'd walk to the gate, when they walked into a city, they would borrow people's pens. So what they would do is they would fill that whole pen with maybe four different uh, shepherd sheep. There were hundreds of sheep all in this pen. When he says, the shepherds know my voice and not another they'll follow, the shepherd would walk to that gate, open up that gate, and call their sheep. And the sheep out of the hundreds would know which shepherd was theirs. And he began, they began to follow one by one, and the shepherd would check on their way out. Yep, this is my sheep. I'm looking after them. This is what a shepherd does. God is our good shepherd is our example. Myself as a pastor is an example of a shepherd. Those who lead you are examples of shepherds. You have to listen to the good shepherd's voice. He wants to talk to you. Don't follow another voice. You'll know his voice because he loves you. And at times he'll correct you, even when you don't like it, but it's because he loves you. Not only are benefits of solitude, souls become refreshed, but he also restores our soul. Poor habits and destructive behavioral patterns indicate an out-of-balance inner life. When you're not at peace, it tends to begin to unravel everything else. Taking time out, gives God the opportunity to recalibrate our souls. When we pull away, I don't know about you, but it just seems like more and more every day, more things keep filling up my calendar. 
more things keep putting on my to-do list. Now, I have to-do lists about the to-do list. If you don't believe me, look at my office. I got this big old board, and there's to-do lists for everything. And now I got to break that to-do list down. There's more constant demands on us every single day. Every day, more demands. And if we don't learn this discipline of pulling away, it will begin to unravel everything else in our lives. I want to encourage you, make time to get alone and hear your shepherd's voice. Psalm 23, 3 says, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Maybe you've been wandering as a sheep feeling burnt out, tired, wanting to throw in the towel. When you come to the good shepherd, he wants to restore your soul. He loves you. Benefits of solitude, there's also, he brings healing to our soul. Also a time where we can begin to listen. We're a place where we can quiet down our souls and begin to take inventory on our life. For some of you this week, you're going to begin taking inventory even with your own family. Maybe you're single here. Even for you, even more so, you're probably going to have to take some inventory and say, what is it that maybe I need to take off my schedule that isn't as important? I've had to do that. Thankfully, my wife helped me. She's like, all right, you keep adding on things, but what are you taking off? Thank you. She's like the Holy Spirit in a skirt. She helps me as my aid to come alongside of me when I listen, when I don't, I tend to get in trouble. So, you know, you're constantly adding on these things, but what are you going to take off of that list? Whew, I don't like to hear that, but yeah, she's right. And I got to learn to take some things off. Maybe this week you're going to have to take some inventory. Begin to see what on that schedule needs to come out, maybe even for a small portion to take away and reprioritize what's important and what truly matters. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's something in the church that you're called to do. Maybe God's calling you with a specific area to step out and do and minister in, but you're so consumed with everything else. Maybe it's time making time for a friend who's always been there. I don't know what it is, but make some time, ultimately, clear time in your schedule for God because he wants to speak to you. Amen. The practice of solitude like other religious practices, can be taken to an unhealthy extreme. I had to put this in there to give you a balance, okay? Because some of you is like, man, pastor, thank you. I'll be sitting in this room all day. No. Solitude is not a place to live. You don't live in solitude. You pull away for a time of Resting and restoring and healing and speaking, but you don't live in solitude. You don't live in the cave. Elijah couldn't live in the cave. For a moment, you may pull away in solitude, but you can't remain or live there in solitude. It can be taken to extremes. For a moment, pull away, withdraw. We're not hermits, we're not like little crabs away in our shells, completely separate from society. That's not what Jesus taught us. He taught us to pull away, hear the voice, get restored, and get right back in there. You get right back in the game. Put me in, coach. I want to go in. Jesus wants to heal you, restore you, speak a word to you, refresh you, so that you can come back. And be life-giving, speaking words of healing to your family, to your marriage, to your friends, at your workplace, on your jobs. He wants to touch you in that place of solitude so you can come back and impact where you live. Silence is less about doing and more about being. It's not about doing or, or I got to do this, but about being. It's about being with him. Thanks for checking out our sermon here at Connect Point Church. We're so glad that you came across this message and hope it has blessed you. We would love to connect with you. You can find us online at connectpointchurch.com and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Have a great day and God bless.